there are different kinds of tools that you can use to think about the future. But I always say that before you start thinking about the future, you need to understand the past. So in every project in which we're trying to develop scenarios, we first start with history um, and understanding there are patterns in history that repeat themselves. And for example, in our work on pandemic scenarios, which we just uh, published, we started with looking back. This is not the first time in human history that we've experienced pandemics and they do have a certain pattern. They often start as health events, but they inevitably lead to economic disruptions and sometimes even political transformations. Uh, people always talk about, academics like to use the example of bubonic plague, which many think is responsible for ending feudalism in Western Europe, simply because there were not enough workers to, to do all the work. Um, and so starting with history and understanding history is really important. I think that's the first step. And the other techniques that we use is we call signals, looking for signals, things that are here and now today, but they're kind of on a small scale. Maybe it's a new discovery in science. Maybe it's a new technology that's being built. Maybe it's um, a new pattern um, of work. Uh, a new way, uh, new cultural norm or social norm. So looking at these signals and figuring out what is the larger story they're telling you. And so between historical analysis and analysis of signals and creating some frameworks, it, it helps you think about potential scenarios for the future. I think we're in one of these periods where we're surrounded, there, it seems to be like we're, there is a crisis every day happening. We're in the middle of a crisis and clearly we need to be able to deal with here and now and getting our organizations through this crisis, surviving through this. Um, so we do need to focus on dealing with the immediate. But the other thing that we need to understand is that what we're experiencing today is a result of choices and decisions we made probably decades ago. And so just as our actions are important today, what we're doing today is creating kind of a scaffolding for the next 10 to 20 years. So this is a moment where you need to be operating at both levels, dealing with here and now and the immediate crisis and solving that, but you also need to be thinking about the future. How do you learn about the future? The Institute has a lot of resources. You can go to our website. We have trainings, we have programs. Uh, you can work, uh, ask uh, other companies how they're doing it. I think the first step is wanting to do this. And then there are a lot of, then you want to kind of build the infrastructure within your organization for doing this. And I don't mean like you need to create a department or you need to assign somebody. You can train a lot of people in the organization uh, to do this work, but creating kind of a platform. So if you have people who are tracking like historical precedent or you can, um, you have groups of people that are assembling signals, can you create an infrastructure for them to exchange that information, to really think about what's the larger story that it's telling, where the connections might be. And getting outside input, you know, the Institute and other groups and organizations who do it professionally and have a lot of expertise and resources and tapping those resources and connecting them to your internal organization. I believe that you can't think about innovation or new services or new products without thinking about the future because your products you're building and services you're creating will live in the future. So we always say that a good strategy starts or a good innovation starts with a good insight about the future. So to me, future thinking is the first step like creating a landscape and thinking about possibilities is absolutely essential if, if you're going to create and invest in innovative products and services. To me, it's absolutely essential. I think the process of building scenarios uh, and thinking about, you know, we have this um, term, like the difference between waves and tides. So waves is something you see on the surface, they come and go, right? But underneath it, 
there's a larger tide that's driving these waves. So you need to get below and understand this tide. So when you build scenarios, and in our work, we, we like using this alternative scenarios methodology that looks at four sort of archetypes of different scenarios, growth, things continuing as they are, constraint, operating under some environment of constraint, collapse, systems or subsystem collapse and transformation. And it allows you to explore all of these possibilities. And the reason it's important is because it's not that we think one scenario is going to necessarily emerge and exactly in the way that we describe it, but that there are pieces of all of these scenarios, that there are these tidal forces that are driving a lot of these scenarios that helps you actually prepare for whatever might come. And so it's a combination of understanding these underlining forces, exploring a whole range of possibilities and going through the process that actually prepares you for these possibilities. And as I said in, in my uh, presentation earlier, it's doing it with some degree of specificity. The more detail you can add to these scenarios, the more prepared you will be.